Hi, Steve Parliament. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking at the history of the West Bank, which I was involved in from the moment that I set foot on the West Bank, which was in the fall of 1966, which is, uh, as I think about it, a remarkably long time ago. And having arrived from uh, some summer conventions of the U.S. National Student Association that uh, I had been involved in earlier, I met some wonderful people who became my good friends and colleagues when I got to Minnesota. I came there for graduate school in political science, and one of my buddies, a friend who I met that sum the summer before I came at a student convention, University of Maryland, Howard Keibel, was the student body president at the University of Minnesota, and a, a good friend. He and I were both elected to the National Supervisory Board of the U.S. National Student Association. And I arrived in, in 1966, um, pulled into the Milwaukee Road Station in downtown Minneapolis when it was a functioning railroad station, um, got off the train in a crisp, cold autumn day, and just thought that I had arrived, this was a wonderful time. Uh, three years before that, I had spent a summer at an early convention of the U.S. National Student Association at the University of Minnesota and had fallen in love with the place uh, just because it was so beautiful on the banks of the Mississippi and lush and green, kid from Southern California, thinking that this was a, a beautiful spot and I wanted to come back. I think the other draw for Minnesota, for me, was uh, my advisor who got his PhD at, in political science at Minnesota and wrote a stunningly good book called Political Prairie Fire about the nonpartisan league in North Dakota and Minnesota and organizing efforts by farmers against the power of the bankers in suppressing uh, agriculture prices and uh, organizing of farmers. And that the Nonpartisan League was a grassroots syndicalist effort, uh, not within either of the political parties, to advance a populist, progressive political agenda in the Midwest. And I inherited that background from, uh, from my friend who, had, who encouraged me to come to Minnesota. And I was pleased to, uh, to be there. When I arrived, Howie, my uh, partner who I just mentioned, uh, said that what I would be involved in when I got there was uh, a political effort to organize the uh, precinct caucuses in Minnesota. In anticipation of the upcoming National Democratic Convention uh, a year and a half later. Well, I didn't know what a precinct caucus was at the time and, and soon discovered that, uh, that a precinct caucus in Minnesota is significantly different from a political primary, which we might find in most other states. Uh, and uh, most of you in Minnesota know, of course, what it is, and it's unusual. It requires door-to-door -door organizing and finding people who are sympathetic to whatever cause you are working on to go to a caucus and to caucus in favor of a, of a particular presidential candidate. Well, at this time, the war in Vietnam was starting up and was getting hot, and we were organizing an anti-war movement. Uh, that summer, Allard Lowenstein from New York had come to the summer convention of uh, national students and announced the formation of a Dump Johnson movement, and that we should all go back to our states and organize an effort to uh, encourage Lyndon Johnson not to seek the nomination for president in whatever form that took politically. In Minnesota, that meant organizing precinct caucuses for Eugene McCarthy, the senator from Minnesota. So we had his home base. We were there on the West Bank, which is the, the West Bank of the Mississippi. The main campus of the university is on the East Bank, and the university jumped the river and was just starting to build the West Bank campus when I arrived. So we were organizing the West Bank, which was a charming old riverboat Bohemian Flats community. It was the furthest 
northern point that riverboats could navigate on the Mississippi River before hitting the St. Anthony Falls. So the riverboat workers would get off uh, off their work in the fall before the ice formed, and in winter in uh, in Minneapolis on the West Bank, and that's where they lived. So this Czech Bohemian community of riverboat workers grew up on the West Bank, and that's what created the the culture of that area. There were there was a black community and a Czech community, and generally called Bohemian. Um, it was also the uh, outside edge of what the city of Minneapolis called the liquor patrol limits, which is the when to have a liquor store or to have a bar, you had to be within the liquor patrol limits. That was defined by the furthest distance from City Hall that a foot patrol policeman could walk out to the edge of the liquor patrol limits, work for four or five hours, turn around and walk back to City Hall. Anything outside that circle of perimeter, the city of Minneapolis would not allow a bar to exist. So all the bars are lined up down Cedar Avenue as the outside edge of the liquor patrol limits. It was a charming old neighborhood, lots of music, <clears throat> a, a true ethnic blend of Eastern European and black culture and jazz. And it was just a, I was in heaven. I thought that this was the coolest place I had ever seen coming being a suburban kid in, from Southern California. So I, I came back as a graduate student and instantly went into the McCarthy movement of organizing, which meant going door to door in the whole West Bank community and knocking on a door and said, what do you think of the war? Would you be inclined to go to a precinct caucus to support Senator Eugene McCarthy for president? And if so, we kept a, a, a notebook of that person, the address, and uh, who else might live in the house to remember so that when the precinct caucus came, came around a few months later, we would go back to that person and make sure they got to the precinct caucus. We had a list. We knew who the anti-war people were. We knew who the McCarthy organizers were, and we would go back and find those people. That was door-to-door -door precinct political organizing that started the McCarthy movement on the West Bank. It spread all over Minneapolis and Minnesota and became the format for the anti-war movement. Uh, in, in the, as the caucuses arose, we were able to find hundreds and hundreds of people that caucused in favor of McCarthy and he got many delegates to the National Democratic Convention. At the same time, Lyndon Johnson was running in early primaries for the Democratic nomination. One of those primaries that was coming, he wasn't doing very well. Uh, one of the primaries was Wisconsin. It was an early one at the time. And the Wisconsin primary, just across the river, was critically important for Johnson to win, to, to have a chance of being nominated at the Democratic convention. Well, one of the things that we did was many people from Minnesota went to Wisconsin and did door-to-door -door work there, encouraging people to vote in the primary. Not a caucus, but a vote in the Wisconsin primary to select the delegates for president for the National Convention. So I went to, I went to Wisconsin. I was out in Wausau, Wisconsin, going door-to-door -door in rural Wisconsin, knocking on a farmer's door, walking down the road, a mile and a half down the road and another one. It took lots and lots of time and lots and lots of people going door to door in Wisconsin promoting Eugene McCarthy. On the night before the Wisconsin primary, I was with hundreds of other volunteers who had been working very hard, long hours and lots of walking in Wisconsin trying to encourage people to vote for Eugene McCarthy as an anti-war candidate. We were all sitting tired in, a, in, a, in the meeting room in Wausau, Wisconsin. Johnson comes on the television for a news conference and talks for about half an hour about what he has, what he has tried to do to bring 
the war in Vietnam to a close or to win or whatever it was that he was trying to explain at the time, which was m m not possible to make any logical sense out of because it had not been going well. And the reasons that we were there were not clear, so it was, uh, he was stumbling. And, and not being very articulate, um, after, after explaining his position for some time, he stopped and looked at the camera and said, and I want you to know, I have concluded that I shall not seek, nor shall I accept the nomination of the Democratic Party to run for president of the United States in 1968. Well, the room that I was in erupted. It, it, it was goosebumps and yells and having, having worked that hard the night before the Wisconsin primary, which was a toss-up according to the polls, it, was, it, it felt like the power of popular work, door-to-door, -door, simple organizing, had knocked a sitting president out of the nomination. That was people power. That was a feeling that confronted with the establishment of the party, you could make a difference. We went back to Minnesota, now anticipating that we could work for McCarthy towards the convention and realizing that Vice President Hubert Humphrey was now going to run for president. So here we were in Minnesota with the vice president and previous senior senator from Minnesota and a well-respected liberal, Hubert Humphrey, and a fanatic defender of the war in Vietnam, and Eugene McCarthy, the other senator from Minnesota, opposing the war running against each other in the same state, facing the precinct caucuses where we were trying to find people to go vote for McCarthy. And because people knew Hubert Humphrey, they knew Eugene McCarthy, this is a personal, this be, politics became intensely personal because everybody knew these guys. Hubert Humphrey was known as the kind of politician who would shake your hand, look you in the eye, and say, I need your support, and I'm with you, man. He was grass, he was a tough, hard-nosed, good-time politician. We disagreed with him on very fundamental issues of war and peace, but he knew how to reach people. And if you met him once, the reputation is that he remembered you. He'd meet you again two or three years later and he'd remember your name. Or he'd remember where he met you. He, had, he was a phenomenal face-to-face, -face, hands-on politician in the old, in the traditional sense. He gained his reputation running for mayor of Minneapolis by throwing the Communist Party out of the, Democrat, out of the Democratic Party. And that's where he ga gained his, his fame and his call to glory and he reminded anybody in the anti-war movement about that years afterwards. I threw the Communist Party out of the Democratic Party in Minnesota, and I'm going to throw them out of Vietnam. Same message. And the, the intensity of the, of the struggle over that issue between two people who were both in the same physical place, both from... Minnesota, both having close personal friends, was in extremely intense. And that battle raged on the West Bank as we were going door to door, finding people to go to the precinct caucuses for McCarthy. That's the political environment I stepped into. The other piece of politics that occurred when I was in Minnesota during that, that year, 66, 67, um, I frequently went back to Washington uh, to be on the National Supervisory Board of the U.S. National Student Association. At one of those events, I was approached by the development director for USNSA, who asked me where we get all of our money. 
I said, I was the treasurer of the board. I should have known. I signed checks and approved budgets. And I looked at the, low, the list of places where USNSA got its money, and one, uh, there were foundations, lists of foundations. The development director, Michael Wood, asked me, do you know any of those foundations? Do you know where that money comes from? And I said, well, sure, it comes from the foundation, foundation for Youth and Student Affairs and Crossroads Africa and the Labor Council and all these different national uh, foundations. And he asked me, have you ever been to one? You ever knocked on the door at a foundation in Washington? I said, well, no, I haven't got time. I, I'm in school in Minnesota, and I just come here for the board meetings. He said, you've got to go to a meeting of staff writers for Ramparts Magazine this weekend if you can stay for a couple of days. Ramparts was one of the, the key radical journals of the time and uh, was, according to Michael, publishing a story on the actual source of money into the U.S. National Student Association. I said, okay, I'll go. I went to the, I went to the meeting, I introduced myself and said I'm, from, I'm the treasurer of the board of the National Student Association. The writers at this meeting looked at me like I was a freak. And they said, do you know who funds the U.S. National Student Association? A supposed organization supporting free thought in education and the power of students to promote university life and to engage with other students all over the world in in interchange with intellectual interchange with those students and i said well i know who the foundation names are they said every one of those foundation sources for the national student association is financed by the central intelligence agency the cia has been paying your way for more than 15 years and i was cold sweat flabbergasted I went back to the office and called the chairman of the board, Sam Brown, who was my sweet mate in college. Sam was a, a, a great Democrat, an anti-war organizer. He was at Rutgers School of Practical Politics and went on to Harvard Divinity School and was organizing the moratorium against the war. He became chair of students from McCarthy and was my hero. Sam is a distinguished person and a fine, uh, a fine organizer. I called Sam and said, um, Sam, I've heard some disturbing news and I'd like you to come to Washington and talk this over. He came down. We went to the officers of NSA and said, we have heard from writers for Ramparts that NSA has been financed by the Central Intelligence Agency and still is. Is that true? And the president and vice president all said, not a word of it is true. We've heard those rumors. It's, a, it's just a, a right-wing attack on, on U.S. NSA. Not true. I went back to Minnesota. A week later, I got a call from the president of NSA and said, you got to come back to Washington. We have some news. We went back, Sam and I and the board went back to Washington, and we were told, yes, the story's true. NSA and the student, National Student Association for 15 years has been financed almost entirely by the Central Intelligence Agency, undermining any legitimacy the student movement had at the time. Well, Sam called a news conference, uh, invited the New York Times and the Washington Post, big news conference, and we revealed the story before Ramparts hit the street before the magazine came out. And there are articles, uh, Sam was on the front page of, of the New York Times revealing that story. The, the story was, in, was sad and devastating. As I left Washington, I had a very bad taste in my mouth about our relationship with the federal government. How could the U.S. government do that to what was supposed to be an independent, legitimate national student movement. We got back to, to Minneapolis and uh, Howie and I decided that it was intensely necessary to continue to organize for 
the primary caucuses and the and and for the the convention that were coming up that was coming up uh, in 1968 it just added to the intensity and the feeling that things were things were not as they should be in Washington that we didn't feel good about what was happening there we didn't feel good about uh, Vice President Humphrey running for president and we felt that Eugene McCarthy was was the right approach at the same time when this was going on the city of Minneapolis was taking into consideration an urban renewal plan for the West Bank where we were organizing that would call for the complete demolition of the entire neighborhood and its replacement with high-rise housing owned by a private developer and promoted and pushed by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, another agency of the federal government. This did not add to our confidence in the federal government at that time. It was what we viewed as an example of economic imperialism at home and abroad. And politically, we put those two realities together, that urban renewal and total clearance had the same intense, overbearing, overplanned, and imposing power of a unit of government over those who did not have anything to say about their future. And in a, in a gut way, it connected what we were doing in Vietnam to our own neighborhood. It made us, it, and maybe that's a long, I'm not saying it's analogous, but the feeling of being out of control by your own government connected those things. And the anti-war movement, the organizing that we were doing, and the feeling that we were not going to let a private developer with federal money remove all the housing and destroy this neighborhood, those things got combined in an organic, total way that, that added fire to our passion to take control of our lives. And that was the political reality that was steaming at the time. At that, uh, in 1968, the city approved the urban renewal plan and the Democrats held their convention in Chicago. I went to the convention in Chicago, famous convention in Chicago. I remember being in Lincoln Park, slightly on the north side, north of the loop in Chicago for a couple of nights. Uh, it was full of anti-war activity. People were there all night at the park. About a day before the convention was to begin, the park was full of people celebrating live music and protest all over, uh, all over the park in, in Lincoln Park. At about 10 at night, I remember this so vividly, one end of the park, the whole north end of Lincoln Park, and it's a pretty good size park, many, many blocks, many city blocks large, the entire north end of the park suddenly lit up with a huge bank of intensely bright lights like you would see at a baseball field, a nighttime baseball field. But bank after bank after bank of intensely bright, giant banks of lights, it lit the whole park, as far as you could see, it was, it was eerie and extraordinarily intimidating. A broadcast announcer with a huge microphone said, clear the park, you're occupying this space illegally. And then phalanx of blue-shirted Chicago police with nightsticks 
started walking arm in arm through the park. And it was, it was a battle scene. The bright lights behind them and the cops in a row moving through the park, backlit, was a picture that burns in your mind. And, you, and it just, people ran. I remember I, I ran for the car. I had, a, I had parked on the edge of the park because I had brought some friends from Minnesota and was staying at a, a nearby apartment. We just barely made it to the car, jumped in, slammed the doors, and locked them just as the cops started pounding on our car with their nightsticks. And the, the battle continued in the streets of Chicago for many nights thereafter uh, with, with tear gas and, and skirmishes of protest, which moved to Grant Park in front of the Hilton where many of the Hilton Hotel along, uh, along the, goal, along the uh, Michigan Avenue where many of the delegates were housed in hotels. It was an intense, very sad scene of uh, disruption. Uh, and McCarthy uh, was certainly nominated. He received many votes for president, but Humphrey, uh, because he had the establishment votes behind him uh, was able to secure the nomination for president and uh, it was it was a very bitter defeat uh, for progressive politics at the time we returned to Minneapolis and continued organizing it didn't stop the neighborhood organizing it fed it it encouraged it even more in, that was in 68. In 1970, Cedar Riverside Associates, which is a combination of Keith Heller and Gloria Siegel, which were some investors and a promoter on the West Bank, organized and were given the development rights for the West Bank to proceed. And uh, a year after that, they received a $24 million loan guarantee for the New Communities Program from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. The same year, the New Riverside Cafe was conceived and formed and the Minneapolis and the Cedar Riverside People Center, which was a, a medical walk-in clinic, was formed by friends of mine. I organized the first community meeting of that group. So we had a people center that was organized. We had door-to-door, uh, -door. having gone door-to-door -door for McCarthy, we knew all of the anti-war people in the neighborhood. We knew everybody's name. The neighborhood was extremely well, uh, well organized. And the People Center, North Country Foods, and eventually the West Bank Community Development Corporation were sort of institutional organizations that came out of the organizing that we had done on the West Bank for health care, food delivery, and ownership of land on behalf of the people who lived in that community through a West Bank Community Development Corporation. However, at the same time, the city had awarded the development rights and lent the private developer $24 million. That is what we were confronted with. There was an a constructive, intense neighborhood organization on the one hand and a private developer that was buying up land on the West Bank, financed by the federal government, on the other hand. In 1971, HUD filed an environmental impact statement, which was an environmental assessment of the development plans for Riverside Associates <coughs> for the new town in town. It was not circulated until after we had discovered its existence and we filed an administrative appeal of it and decided that it would be a legal justification for the scope of high-rise, high-density development that would devour the neighborhood. So in 1973, we filed legal action against HUD and the environmental impact statement that HUD had prepared 
to justify the new town in town. At this time, uh, as these as North Country Foods, the People Center, the West Bank CDC were being formed as public entities, HUD refused to organize a project area committee, which is the citizen participation component of an urban renewal plan in the neighborhood that is supposed to accompany any federal involvement in, in redeveloping a neighborhood where you get citizens involved in what's going on. The urban renewal plan called for total clearance because the, by definition we were a blighted neighborhood. Because the urban renewal plan called for total clearance, HUD said, by definition, you do not exist. The neighborhood does not exist. And because it doesn't exist, by definition, even though hundreds of people still live there, we don't need to organize a project area committee to represent your point of view or your, your contribution to the future of the neighborhood because you will be cleared. You, you don't, you're not going to live there anymore. Uh, we filed an appeal of that decision and it, and part of the lack of citizen participation and involvement in the future of the neighborhood became part of our complaint in our challenge to the environmental impact statement. Uh, so the legal action was filed in 1973. Another organization that we formed was called the Cedar Riverside Environmental Defense Fund. That was the official nonprofit group that filed the lawsuit on behalf of the neighborhood, and it was joined by the Project Area Committee that now finally had been formed, and Minneapolis Model Cities, which is a neighborhood planning agency that was recognized by the federal government in another community. So we had allies that joined with us in filing this lawsuit against HUD and challenging the adequacy of the environmental impact statement that justified the first two stages of development. By 1974, because Cedar Riverside Associates had been working on stage one of the new town in town, stage one was becoming a completed new housing development. It involved 10 acres out of about a hundred acres that would be developed, that theoretically was to be developed over time, and 1,303 units of housing with high-rise apartments. This was the first stage of what was going to be about 12,500 units of housing if the full new town in town scheme was to be fully realized. That was uh, the formation of that stage one was a dramatic reality. And if you're familiar with the geography of Minneapolis, <coughs> it's easy to spot. It's on the West Bank next to the university, uh, 39 story high rise and about 15 other buildings that are gray concrete with colored squares in them uh, that, I, that are randomly placed on inspiration from, uh, from the chief architect, Ralph Rapson, who was chair of the architecture school at the university, but also uh, inspired by uh, a French architect, Le Corbusier, who built high-rise uh, housing in France with colored squares, and Heike von Herzen, a, a Finnish architect, who was an, one of the early planners of new towns in town, new town or new communities, planned communities, uh, they borrowed, Rapson borrowed from their ideas to create Cedar Square West. It was finished in 1974 and uh, its dedication uh, was emceed with the primary speaker as George Romney, who had been uh, at the time, because Nixon had won the presidency, one of Nixon's agents to go to Vietnam and see what a great job Nixon was doing with the war. So Romney was used as the, uh, as the speaker for the federal government to dedicate Cedar Square West. That just connected the war in Vietnam with 
the anti-war movement on the West Bank even more intensely, and there were uh, there were anti-war protests and riots throughout Minneapolis uh, when uh, when that dedication occurred in 1975 to 76. Cedar Riverside Associates had stopped making interest payments on the mortgage that they got from the federal government. And the formation of Credif at that time uh, meant that we were pursuing a lawsuit and we were able to raise funds from a private foundation to keep the challenge to stage two going. Stage one was built. The environmental impact statement was a justification for the continuation of the Newtown in town. And we had filed a lawsuit against it. During the period of 75 and 76, we were able to raise funds to pay for the lawsuit against the federal government. And in 1976, a special master who was appointed by Judge Miles Lord, who is a populist judge and kind of radical in his own right, the special master, after a lengthy substantive hearing on the merits of the environmental impact statement against HUD and against the Newtown, came to the conclusion that the environmental impact statement was significantly and substantially inadequate in its exploration of alternatives to high-density high-rise housing, and that no future funds from the federal government or from the city of Minneapolis could be spent on development on the West Bank. We won the lawsuit after we filed it in 73. The judgment was announced in 1976. It was appealed by Cedar Riverside Associates in, and HUD in 1977. And in 1978, eventually, after all of this turmoil, Cedar Riverside Associates was removed as the developer and HUD foreclosed on the property and took the land back. It took a U.S. foreclosure to remove Cedar Riverside Associates and a receiver of the land was appointed. In 77, Cedar Riverside Associates decided that maybe what they could do uh, to defend themselves was to evict everybody in the neighborhood. So they increased the rents across the board on the West Bank with all of those of us who lived there by 50% in one month. And for low-income people, uh, that was financially a disaster. It instantly caused the East West Bank Tenants Union to be organized and stimulated a giant rent strike of 150 units against Cedar Riverside Associates. And each one of those people who uh, withheld rent received an eviction notice. So it was the strategy of the developer to raise the rents, remove everybody, and get rid of this whole, uh, of the whole uh, organizing that was going on uh, around them and uh, remove the threat of a continued injunction against funding coming into the neighborhood. On June 30th of 1978, a commercial tenant, which is one of our allies, the New Riverside Cafe, had withheld rent and was part of the rent strike. They were evicted by CRA. CRA refused to accept back rent the community union, which was the national, which was the uh, organization that we used to do whatever needed to be done to support ourselves, raised money to pay the back rent for the New Riverside Cafe. The cafe tried to pay rent to Cedar Riverside Associates. It didn't work. CRA refused to accept the rent and uh, was trying to hold an eviction against the New Riverside Cafe. The legitimacy of the, of the eviction went to the Minnesota Supreme Court. 
New Riverside Cafe said we are not leaving and you have to accept our rent. The CRA appealed the decision which was not to evict the New Riverside Cafe all the way to the Minnesota Supreme Court. The landlord, CRA, won at the Minnesota Supreme Court which said you have the right to evict whoever you want. That was on June 30th, 1978. The next day, on July 1st, 1978, CRA was removed as the receiver of the property and a new landlord was appointed, so their effort to evict and clear the neighborhood through a giant rent strike failed. Even though they had been removed as the landlord and were no longer the developer of record, CRA, the corporate entity, turned around and sued the city of Minneapolis and the redevelopment authority of the city for not coming through with funds that had been promised as part of the urban renewal and redevelopment activity on the West Bank. And that case then went to court in 1979 because Cedar Riverside Associates wanted funds from the city to pay for their expenses and holding costs and felt that they had not been treated fairly by the city of Minneapolis. In 1986, it took that long, but in, by 1986, from 79 to 1986, HUD finally completed the final foreclosure proceedings against Cedar Riverside Associates and that lawsuit by the developer against the city for not giving them the money that they thought was owed to the private developer was uh, decided in favor of the city. And the, the court record and the opinion of the court is quite clear on that point that funds, urban renewal funds and housing funds are designed not for the purpose of a private developer. They are not a special class. They are not to be considered different from the purpose of the financing or the money that was set aside for housing. The judge in the case of CRA versus the city simply said the money that was promised is promised for the use and development of housing, not to underwrite a troubled private developer. And that was a that was that was one of the one of the finest pieces of opinion on what federal funds are for that I have read in that court case. That federal money is not designed to underwrite private developers. It's designed to fulfill a social purpose. And a private developer, according to this judge in that case, can't file a complaint because a city changes its mind and does not award funds to a private developer. In the environmental impact statement, which was decided on appeal in 1976, uh, the, the district court finds the EIS inadequate and uh, the, uh, on appeal, HUD lost that case. The appeal concluded that development by A private developer is not designed to promote the interests of, of the private party. In the opinion of the special master in the case of the environmental challenge uh, in Cedar Riverside that, to, that we filed, the special master concluded that it is easy enough to see why the investors in Cedar Riverside would prefer to see the greater part of their investment go into high-rise buildings. We were challenging the alternative of high-rise, high-density housing. 
even though that requires Class A construction. The obvious advantage of such depreciable asset as high-rise buildings are for the tax shelter considerations and not to be stressed the land on the other hand as being too expensive. The idea that the funds were needed, the high density and high rise construction were dictated only according to the special master's opinion in the environmental impact statement case by profit making and probably by tax shelter considerations. So the EIS statement and the opinion of the judge and the challenge of the private developer to the city of Minneapolis in both cases were that the high-rise, high-density and tax shelter and for-profit considerations of the private developer should not dictate and determine the only alternative for housing to be built with public funds. So as I've been thinking about this case and the activity that went on on the West Bank, a couple of things come to mind. Uh, behind, the, behind the organizing that, that I've described here, behind the formation of food co-ops, People Center, West Bank Community Development Corporation, Cedar Riverside Environmental Defense Fund, the Project Area Committee, the New Riverside Cafe, the East West Bank Tenants Union, those were institutional manifestations of the neighborhood organizing that arose from the anti-war movement and from the total clearance efforts of the city to remove the neighborhood. Those institutions and the things that were created in that neighborhood of, are things that we are intensely proud of. And they are still there. The legacy is that the People Center is one of the most successful health care center, community health care centers in the, in the Midwest and has received awards for it and was determined by Medica to be the best clinic providing health care to women in the, uh, in the Twin Cities, uh, the People Center and two other clinics, has received very distinguished awards. North Country uh, Food Co-op as an entity does not exist, but grew into a whole co-op food mo movement and to a warehouse movement that provides food distributed to co-op food grocery stores all over the upper Midwest. North Country Foods as a co-op has morphed into what is now called North Country Development Fund, which is a consulting and funding organization that promotes the formation of new co-ops. So the effort in food organizing, health care through People Center is as strong as ever. The old neighborhood and the community that was saved by the injunction against the new town in town is in the hands of cooperatives that are run and governed by the people who live there. So our, our alternative of medium density resident-owned housing is the way housing is now owned on the West Bank with investors who have taken advantage of uh, tax low-income housing tax credits to help finance the development. Cedar Square West, which was stage one of 10, is the only high-rise, high-density housing plan for the neighborhood. And the new town in town concept of extremely high density uh, was, was not the viable alternative that Cedar Riverside Associates wanted. So the politics of the neighborhood have survived. The, the effort that went into that work is reflected in the way that the community is owned and operated now and is a testament to the, the power of people organizing and staying with it to form alternative institutions. The language of the environment of NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, which asks you as a federal agent to look at a range of possible alternatives that might serve the public the best. What's the best way to deliver what it is that we're trying to build? In our case, low-income housing. 
The alternative that we promoted is medium density, resident owned, energy efficient housing. And for the most part, that's what we have. Extremely high density, high rise housing that turned out to be, when we carefully looked at it, very inefficient, is not a good idea. And the financing that was being used to build stage one, Cedar Square West, was largely designed for housing for families with children. And one of the other conclusions of the environmental impact statement litigation is that it is pretty conclusively shown that high-rise housing is inappropriate for families with kids. And that policy is now part of HUD's development criteria for urban development and, and affordable housing in the, in the inner city. There is not a push to build high-rise, high-density uh, housing for families with children. One of, our, uh, one of our key witnesses in the EIS litigation is a spectacular landscape and anthropology architect from the University of California at Berkeley, Claire Cooper, who has studied the relationship between the built environment and the behavior of kids in housing. And her conclusion, looking at thousands of different physical designs, is that medium density housing of a low rise nature where parents can physically see the children playing outside of their window, three story, two, three story uh, apartments that are close and secure is, the, is by far the best approach to protecting children playing outside of the apartment in a physical environment. And that that seems to work quite well, where she's looked at housing like that in many different places. The high-rise housing on the West Bank that was built in Stage 1 is architecturally designed in the worst possible way to provide for natural defensibility against people who do not belong in that housing. And that involves surveillance and being able to see who's coming and going and recognizing your neighbors and having places for children to play that are easily surveyed by parents looking out their window or being close or walking out the door. And the physical design of housing is very important given the psychological and social implications of security. Riverside Plaza is, is a, te a textbook case in how not to design housing that is itself structurally defensible. Um, and the future of, of urban renewal and housing is to look at medium density, which is 30 to 40 units an acre. Uh, Cedar Square West Riverside Plaza is 1,303 units of housing on 10 acres of land. That's 130 units an acre. That's extremely high density. The case in favor of high density housing that was presented by the developer during the trial of the adequacy of the environmental impact statement was uh, a book by Anthony Downs on the cost of sprawl. It was against the idea that we should, uh, the against the urban planning notion of controlling sprawl, not building out to the suburbs, but bring density into the inner city, build more housing closer in to stimulate business, activity on the sidewalk, use space more efficiently, and do things more energy efficiently. What Anthony Downs in The Cost of Sprawl called high-density housing that was presented at the trial was 30 to 40 units an acre. Cedar Riverside Associates with federal money was building 130 units an acre. What the neighborhood now has is about 30 units an acre, which is what the developer said in the case of the environmental impact statement was the desirable level of density that should be used in future urban planning. In other words, the neighborhood's doing it right. And looking back at that, a lot of that organizing 
came from a very amorphous group of people, myself and all of our friends and neighbors, that we called the Community Union. It is not organized, it was not incorporated, it had no board of directors, it had no list of members. It was the neighborhood group that when something needed to be done, when the rent had to be paid for the new Riverside Cafe, when we had to find a location for the People Center to move, the People Center was a medical center that was temporarily housed in the waiting room of the People Center, and a health care inspector came by and said, you can't put a health, you can't put a food co-op with open bins of grain in the waiting room of a health care center where people are sick. You can't, those two things are incompatible. You've got to move out. So the community union helped find a place for the food co-op to locate and helped pay for that. The community union is a non-membership, non-leadership, organic community organization that formed whenever the call was made to have a union meeting to defend the neighborhood in some way. And whenever that call went out, the neighborhood got together, hundreds of people would come to a community union meeting, everybody would talk and figure out what our next strategy was, and then a plan was devised and people would go out and do what they were interested in to promote that plan. So the community union was a quiet, uninstitutional, spontaneous, though organic and well-connected connection or network of people. And it, it doesn't really have a model in other kinds of urban planning. It is not a community development corporation. That is a formal structure. All the other organizations I've talked about are formal. The union was informal and extremely effective. And the other coordinating piece of this that I have thought about as I've read back over the notes on how this all actually happened. The community union was a mass organization. Once these different organizations People Center, the Food Co-op, the West Bank CDC, the Project Area Committee, the Tenants Union, Crediff, the lawsuit, when, when all of these different organizations were working on their own special area of work, there was a, a group that we called, and this isn't written down any place, there are no records, there are no meetings, there's not an organizational structure, it was never incorporated but we called it the War Council. And during the time that we were trying to save the neighborhood in a defensive and positive, constructive way, we formed a War Council. And, and representatives of each of those institutions that were created in the neighborhood would meet as a War Council. No notes, no specific leadership, again, no board, but a very intense network of very committed people from all of those different neighborhood organizations to talk about what our next strategy was. What should we do to raise money for the lawsuit? What should we do to defend people who are in court facing eviction? What should we do to get federal recognition for the People Center? What should we do if North Country Foods needs uh, another place for uh, for it to be organized or a location for it to function. The War Council was, was what you might call the key group in insurgency, the coordinating body in a revolutionary movement or an insurgent movement that would get to the next step, that would get things organized and moving and everyone would decide what they could do, what tasks they could perform. They went back to their respective organizations. And the community union was a mass group. The War Council was a very focused, small group of leaders from each of the institutions we had built. And those two structures, I don't even call them, they were entities 
they were networks. They were organic groups of people who were totally dedicated and committed to defending the neighborhood and building a new, a new society in that neighborhood. Um, and there is no record of it. Um, we will not have papers to donate to the historical society. Um, there are no minutes. No article was ever written about it, but that was the coordinating body that pulled all of this off. And when a neighborhood is faced with that kind of potential for being evicted and cleared, that's the kind of intense communication that's necessary. And it means trust. The people who work together, of all of the things that I really got from all of this organizing, is how, how to trust the instincts of your friends and neighbors. Because I think without, without that, uh, it wouldn't have been possible to pull all of this stuff off. And it's, it is a pleasure to walk, through, uh, to walk through the neighborhood and see these institutions as they, uh, as they exist now. So that's, the, uh, that's as far as the story goes. Um, and uh, 10 years from now, we'll come back and reassess. Thanks for your time. To get one more thing on the record, if you wouldn't mind. Fine. Just ask a question. Uh, when I was walking in uh, in Dinky Town years ago, I'm in the 70s somewhere, I remember being puzzled because a limo stopped. You know, a limo in Dinky Town, a big one. Limos? Yeah. And some guys got out and they poked around a little bit, and I got back in. Now, it, I mean, when I tell myself the follow-up story to what you said, here's what I tell myself. The same guys are their brothers who didn't make it on the West Bank, realized, took account of the arguments about you know, family housing, right. but also took account of, um, you know, the power of an organized community mm -hmm. and realized that the one place you can't have an organized community that means anything is in student. That's right, it's uh, hard in to In a student right. area. Furthermore, that you could persuade the University of Minnesota that. Uh, Maybe the university didn't need any persuading, but somehow or other they decided they were going to be a residential campus. Uh -huh. Those two things together simply meant, you know, well now we can get the density we want and the tax advantages <laughs> we want in Dinky Town. In why do we not? Why do we need to mess around right. with with the West Bank? <laughs> right. Now, now that's all spun out of me seeing one. One limo, limo. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, in on a on a bridge that some years later totally collapsed. I mean, it, 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 it <laughs> right. fell in. It was a hole. Right, there's a hole in there. Was. Right. But well, it, these guys kind of looking around. I thought they look like they own the place, and I think they now do. They will probably do. They probably <laughs> now, do. Now, am I? I mean, tell me, tell me how far off base I am here. Well, I'm sure that you're correct because there was speculation on the way, on the East Bank like crazy, uh, but it was more here and there. They, as far as I know, the difference is I don't believe they tried to assemble a huge tract of land to do a, a unified development. I think what they were doing was buying pieces mm -hmm. as they were as they were able to, and putting that into an investment trust. Uh, because they probably they they probably realized that assembling large blocks of land in an existing neighborhood is counterproductive. It's just a waste of time. Uh, but that's very possible. What I don't know is who the actual people are, because the principal people in Cedar Riverside Associates um, are no longer with us. They uh, they didn't go on to do future development. Keith. Heller and Gloria Siegel both died shortly after this story unfolded. So it was not them. Now others may have picked up and decided uh, to, to look at 
at the success and failure that they went through, but it wasn't the same. I don't believe it was the same cast of characters. But the picture of replacing relatively low density housing, yeah. much higher density right. housing, in a much more kind of corporate environment, um, that's that's the same picture, yeah. right? Yeah. Not quite as high a rise, right? But the same picture. They're the same kind of picture. That's true. And with the same kind of tax advantages. Well. Not quite. Um, Student housing doesn't have the it's same just, kind of... It just advantage. doesn't have the same tax advantages. Um, you know, acquiring uh, walk-up apartments that are largely for student housing doesn't generate the same ta uh, low-income housing tax credits that Riverside, Cedar Riverside Associates and Riverside Plaza used. Uh, the, the tax credits that were generated on the West Bank were, were much more intense and had a higher level of return. Uh, there was an acquisition of medium density old buildings on the West Bank that uh, at a time when the acquisition of those properties utilized an accelerated form of depreciation where the government, the IRS allowed someone to buy old property, establish the, uh, the capital base and write that, that capital base off as depreciation at a very rapid rate of, of decline. Standard commercial property, standard residential property is written off over almost a straight line 30 and a half year depreciation period, which doesn't give you much return. One thirtieth of the value of a piece of commercial housing uh, that is that declines handed to an investor is not a big deal. It's not an incentive to do Lots of, lots of development work. But if you decline, if you allow that depreciation to accelerate at a very fast rate to take a lot of depreciation up front, you can collect a lot of investors early. That's what happened on some of the investment on the West Bank um, to take advantage of accelerated depreciation. Whether that was something available after it, that changed after 1986, the only entities that could take accelerated depreciation after 86 were corporations, not individuals. And it's possible that, that corporations were then looking to acquire uh, depreciable housing on an accelerated rate after, 1980, after the Tax Reform Act of 1986. And that's possible what these investors were, were looking at. The only, the only way to stimulate serious tax credits is with, uh, is with low-income housing tax credits that requires uh, substantial renovation or new construction. I mean, very ex major renovation or new construction uh, combined with historic tax credits. And it's possible uh, that requires a designation of an historic landmark. Now, I don't know enough about Dinkytown to know if any of those properties were declared as historic landmarks. I don't think so. If any of, I think the only way that they that there would be an incentive for investment in those Dinkytown properties would be corporate investment in accelerated depreciation. And that's possibly what they were looking for. Riverside Plaza is an entity that obtained a historic landmark designation in 2010 because of its unusual design and architectural style and history. That designation then generated historic tax credits that were sold for, for the next round of investor. And that 
that was very profitable to uh, to an investor in Riverside Plaza when it was resyndicated. But that's probably not what was available in Dickeytown. So there's a, a, a fairly interesting line of investigation to pursue in saying, okay, we have uh, the West Bank story right. and the East Bank story. Right. <laughs> now, what parts of the West Bank story carry over <laughs> and, and what has to be amended uh, to, to, make that, to, ma to make that history fit? I mean, there, there, it, it seems like there's a whole lot of provocative stuff from the way it went down on the West yeah. Bank that suggests ways of reading other de development in other areas. Sure. You know, and so what happens if this doesn't happen? What <laughs> happens if the... I mean, you had, as it were, a perfect storm of populist, uh, <laughs> populist stuff on the West Bank. Right. And, and so the question is, what happens when that populist stuff doesn't intervene at this? It doesn't that, intervene, because that, that's, that was so much of the catalyst of all the activity, all the frantic activity that was going on on the West Bank to save the neighborhood. And what happened is that it just inspired all this development effort. Um, there certainly are neighborhoods where the threat of clearance and replacement do show up. And the place that comes to mind most quickly is the Seward neighborhood just south of the West Bank, uh, south of Franklin Avenue, where many private developers were beginning to acquire property on the same model as Cedar Riverside Associates. But the Seward neighborhood, Seward redesign, very quickly because they were allies. We were talking, we knew each other. We were talking. They organized the same, they were a step ahead of the developer. They were prepared. And the story in Seward is that they started making clear to the developers that the same thing was not going to happen there. They organized tenants, they, uh, they organized a strong urban renewal plan, they, uh, they ran uh, people on the city council who were sympathetic to the neighborhood movement um, to defend the neighborhood before the developers were able to acquire lots of land. So uh, that's the area that comes quickly to mind that I know uh, followed the West Bank model and said, well, if, you, if you mess around here, we're going to do what, they, what the crazy people in the West Bank did and we'll keep you out. And it, it actually worked. And there are probably many other neighborhoods in the Twin Cities where something like that is going on. There's a huge amount of neighborhood organizing at the council level in St. Paul um, and in, in Minneapolis. One of the things that happened after the West Bank is that the politics of Minneapolis and St. Paul changed the city councils became very sensitive to listening to neighborhood councils, neighborhood project area committees, and involved neighborhoods in the planning process in, in much earlier than they did in Riverside, in the West Bank. And that has changed the development profile of both cities, so that the inner city neighborhoods are much more likely to be saved now and integrated into renovation instead of clearance. So I, I think that it is happening, uh, maybe not in the dramatic way of the West Bank, but in a more uh, low-key but uh, participatory sense. This, the, the neighborhoods in Minneapolis were identified and organized, and then the city, uh, when when Fraser was mayor, Fraser was mayor for Don Fraser, the congressman from uh, Minneapolis, was mayor after he was congressman for many years. During that planning process, the neighborhoods were involved in with the redevelopment agency 
in planning what happens in the neighborhood and we're actually given a, a piece of the city budget to decide how to spend public money in their neighborhood. Instead of awarding contracts to private developers, city money was given to neighborhood organizations and it became the citizen model of the West Bank became politically popular for the aldermans because they realized that if they could connect their neighborhood council to give them money and then make them part of the decision-making process, they were, they were linking the neighborhood to the city council in a very organic way. So the neighborhoods became politically powerful through aldermanic elections. And the whole structure of, of the, the neighborhoods in Minneapolis changed dramatically. So I think it's, I think it's happened in a, in a way that it is not as dramatic as, as the way the, that it unfolded on the West Bank. I want to refer, turn to the, for the last question to one to the thing, place we started which was the CIA involved oh, with, sure. with the National Student Association. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, you know, that's, a, that's the, that's, as it were, the power struggle story several chapters further. Yeah. So you, you have an opposing force, and they struggle, and then all of a sudden, somewhere along the line, one of the parties decides that, the way to win is to take over the people they're fighting with, <laughs> or at least to, to so, so seriously involve themselves with the people they're fighting with that uh, those people are basically uh, uh, deauthorized as, as spokespeople. That point can't have been lost on developers, can it? In other words, that the way to win this thing is to be in the opposition, is to be in the neighborhood council, <laughs> is to be, yeah, right. you know, is, you know, and either you promote an idiot <laughs> and thereby discount them, or you promote somebody who looks pretty sensible. Who will throw? Who will throw? Throw the key vote. You see this stuff happening, or am I just being one of those paranoid? Because <laughs> it happened the first time. I mean, presumably the reason the CIA was involved with the National Student Association was they never got up. I mean, presumably they weren't particularly worried about getting rid of Johnson, or or this or this would have surfaced a whole lot earlier. Yeah, right. right. But. They wanted to be able to pull the plug on this organization yeah. if it ever got close to anything important. Exactly. And, and they yeah. they wanted it to look independent. The, the actual, my understanding is that the way the connection began was uh, during the Eisenhower administration where, if this is correct, John Foster Dulles was Secretary of State and Alan Dulles was head of the CIA. And they, John Foster Dulles was worried about the left, the left wing orientation of the national of the national student movement. They, they were concerned that national U.S. national students were going to Europe and Africa and South America and getting radicalized. So they wanted to suppress that. Dulles wanted to to prevent that connection from going through. Alan Dulles said, don't worry about it. Let them do it. But we'll pay for them. We'll, in, we'll let them. We'll, we'll, pay, we'll pay for them to, to go off and be connect to left-wing student movements all over the world. And what the CIA got from that by by co-opting the national student movement, they they had the president of USNSA was told when after the national convention of the student association elected a new president, and that person who was just a college student who ran for president of USNSA 
was told by a CIA agent. He didn't know it was a CIA agent, but he was told by an agent of the U.S. government that there is something that that person needs to know to be able to function effectively as president of the U.S. National Student Association. If you want to know what the secret is, you must swear that you will not reveal this secret to any other member of USNSA. It is between you and us. If you don't want to know, then that's okay. We won't tell you what the information is, but uh, you probably will not be able to function very effectively as president of the association. Every president of USNSA from the time the CIA started this connection, years, 15 years ago, or 20 years earlier, said, let me know, I'll keep it secret. And they were told, then the president of NSA was told that the money comes from the Central Intelligence Agency. What they got for that was from USNSA has staff people connecting with international student movements all over the world. They pay a, a person to go to connect with the French student movement, the Greek student in South America. They have, and what the CIA wanted was all their field notes. They wanted, they wanted to know who the next generation of leaders were in student movements all over the world. They wanted to early create early dossiers of potential rabble rousers or national leaders who were coming up through the student associations in all these different countries. That information came back to Washington and was handed over to the Central Intelligence Agency and that's what they got for it. So they co-opted and they put their guy in into the, the United States Association uh, from the from the very start, and paid for them, and and it, it like a developer sitting on the council of a neighborhood planning council, you know. They they got what they needed out of a, out of the relationship. So, so anybody who wants to make uncomfortable change for any entity. Mm -hmm. Is going to play the same game, right? They, they, and and if they're playing a long game, there may be all kinds of successes from the other side and failures from your side. Right. Just not the ultimate. You know, what's Kutuzov? You know, the only battle that matters is the last one. That's right. Exactly. And uh, and that has you know what that is depends on the ages of the people involved generally. Right. Um, so if I'm getting it right, I'm getting the picture right. You it must be a pretty nervous thing to be, to be in the leadership. <laughs> That's I mean, right. after yeah. the National Student Association story. Yeah. Especially given how much success the CIA was willing to let you have. Sure. When presumably they could have discredited the organization right. at but, any time. By but reason. they'll push you out there. Right. But no, so so realizing that CIA was playing that kind of a long game, you return to the West Bank <laughs> and dig in. <laughs> but you, but you know that the folks in power will keep playing. Will keep playing game. the game, absolutely. And that you know you can't, especially in an open organization, you can't trust your colleagues. You can't trust, uh, you know, you, 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 you can't in some sense trust yourself. Yeah, right. Uh, I mean, where does that leave you? Uh, I mean, if you hadn't had that NSA experience before, it would have been very different. Yeah, it would have been very different. Yeah. Where did it leave you realizing that victories may turn out to be defeats? They turn on their, they turn on their head, exactly. It's a, it's a perplexing, uh, if, you, if you can, just continue to, to stay vigilant to the original image if, you, if it's possible to do that.
Yeah. The fear, the fearful thing Elliot named it in, in Murder in the Cathedral, the last temptation and the greatest treason is to do the right deed for the wrong reason. <laughs> and then, but but the other thing was, uh, Elliot named this too. The memory of things ill done and done to others harm, which once we took for exercise of virtue. Oh. <laughs> and that's the right. terrifying thing. Yeah. Because you can't ever know how long a game yeah. the other side is playing. Yeah. Uh, it's a fascinating yeah, story. Yeah, it's fascinating. And they'll, they keep playing. They just don't ever stop. They're, well, in, they got made immortal. The corporate end piece yeah. of it got made immortal. Mm-hmm. That was... Yeah, the corporate... The, the corporate entity, the corporate interest lives forever. Not so little boys. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Oh, sure.